Right, okay, let's get to today's session, which is why you're all here, uh, with the wonderful Olga Hamilton. And um, Olga ran a couple of sessions for us last year that were very popular. Uh, but for those of you who don't know Olga, I'm just going to introduce you to her. She's one of uh, the UK's leading nutritional therapists. Um, and she's a resident nutritionist at Body Maya, who are our partners. And uh, she's also a TEDx speaker. And so we will be posting the link to her TEDx um, talk on the forum um, over the next few days. So you can find it on there. So Olga, Olga always has lots to share. So we have split Olga's sessions into two parts. Uh, so she can also answer your questions as we go along. Now, Olga, for those of you who came to last time, will know that it, she is very thorough and she's science-based. So she always applies the latest researches and um, advances in the field of nutrition, nutrigenomics, nutrigenetics, and functional medicine. That was a bit of a mouthful. I got my mouth around that one. <laughs> Olga works with highly complex bio data to um, identify imbalances within the body and rebalance them through targeted advanced nutritional interventions. So she can really offer her clients um, a very personalized approach. And I know some of you uh, who were at uh, the last, her last talks have, um, have she's built personalized programs for you. Um, and um, I, I know that uh, have been successful for you. So Olga will be teaching us over these two sessions what we need to do to look out um, for in terms of personalizing our own approach to weight loss and the various factors that come into play with that. Uh, so we'll get going. Um, can I ask you all please to keep your mics on mute so not to disturb um, others with any background noise. And as usual, we'll be putting questions into chat and uh, we'll, uh, we'll try and address them throughout the session. We'll, Olga will be kind of talking and then we'll, we'll stop periodically and we'll um, address some of the questions. So Olga, let me uh, hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Stella, and welcome everyone. So happy to see so many people and I hope you find this useful. I'm just going to um, open my presentation and then uh, share my screen so you can see my presentation as well. Okay, great. Um, oh, slightly slow computer. Yeah, but it all works. Okay, fantastic. So today I wanted to talk to you about uh, metabolism and how this metabolism relates to our weight regulation. This is such a wonderful uh, word, this metabolism, but it's, it's very... Um, very interesting as well, isn't it? So what is it, this metabolism that escapes us and always slows down that we can't catch up with? Um, but it's um, uh, usually when we talk about metabolism, it's, uh, it relates to everything, all processes that happen within our cells. So it's everything from how we absorb nutrients to how we use nutrients to how we make energy. So everything is referred to as metabolism. But today specifically, we will be talking about metabolism that relates only to how we burn fat or how we uh, get our energy from the foods that we eat and what happens with that in terms of weight regulation. Um, so um, uh, as Stella said, we have two sessions. Uh, so today I will try to cover all of this so we'll talk about metabolism, we'll talk about different weight loss diets and how exactly they work. And uh, we'll talk about blood sugar. Yeah, there's a lot of different opinions on blood sugar and most of them are frankly a bit confusing. Uh, we'll talk about something that's called metabolic flexibility. And this is the key uh, information that I'd like to for you to take on from today's session and perhaps apply in your daily life. This is the secret how you can um, you know, how you can improve your metabolism. We will talk about the fat switch. There are actually a couple of books on the fat switch, how you can switch between, um, you know, burning your energy from carbohydrates to burning your fat stores and what you need to do in order to get there. 
Uh, we'll talk about different meal frequencies, so intermittent fasting, you know, keto diets, low carbohydrates, low fat, calorie counting, all of this. And um, I'll teach you how you can uh, calculate your BMR, which is the basal metabolic rate. And we'll also talk about some um, uh, this ACE track. So this is a wonderful device that just um, appeared on the market. Uh, it's um, it can measure your metabolism. So hopefully we'll have enough time for all of this today. So like, right, there's so many different diets, weight loss diets, and we know that weight loss industry is so popular and it makes a lot of money, of course, because why? Because it doesn't work most of the time. We know from scientific studies that if people go on very restrictive diets, when they stop that restrictive diet, the weight comes back. So the key here that I want you to remember through the whole of the session is it's not about finding that crash diet that works. It's about finding the diet that you can do for a long period of time, which is going to become your normal. So it's not something you go on and then go off. And that would be different for everyone. That's why there's not one perfect diet that would work for every single person. Um, now, but all of these diets, they have something in common. This is how they work. So this is this latest scientific review of all weight loss diets that we have on the market currently. Um, and I've highlighted here for you. So what they found really that high protein, low carbohydrate diets and intermittent fasting, uh, they showed greater weight loss and could be adopted um, as, as a jump start. Um, and what that means really, so all high protein diets, such as we know Atkins, for example, low carbohydrate diets uh, could be like a paleo style diet or just low carb or ketogenic diet um, or intermittent fasting. They really have the same key um, underlying key factor that uh, that makes them work really. And um, that's blood sugar regulation. You probably heard this uh, about blood sugar regulation before, and you probably heard about different approaches, how to do it properly, but it is really the key to how you master your metabolism. And even if there's one thing that you remember from today's session, uh, how, how you can manipulate your blood sugar, you'll be fine. You will never need a nutritionist in your life. You'll know everything you need to know. Mm -hmm. So we're going to try to learn how to control our blood sugar uh, because this is really the basis of regulating your metabolism. Um, okay, so we know about the blood sugar uh, roller coaster. So when we have carbohydrates or sugar or anything that contains carbohydrates and sugar, we digest and absorb these carbohydrates as a simple glucose molecule. And that glucose goes into our blood. It's absorbed into our blood. Um, but our body needs to keep blood glucose at a certain level at all times. If our body can't control our blood sugar, that becomes diabetes. So our body needs to control it. When we have increased glucose in the blood, our body would make insulin. It will signal to our pancreas to make insulin. Insulin is a hormone and its job is to take that blood sugar or that blood glucose from your bloodstream and put it into your cells, into your muscle cells, into your liver cells, into your fat cells. And in order for those cells to use it for energy production, this is how we get energy. Or whatever we don't use at the end of the day, we can store as fat. All of the glucose that we haven't used at the end of the day will be converted into fat and will be stored usually around the middle. So this is where people, uh, majority of people, I would say, who have excess carbohydrates, they start putting the weight around the middle, around the organs. And this is where our body prefers to store it because it's then easy to access. Mm -hmm. So this insulin hormone, 
Um, it's probably only famous uh, in terms of when people get diabetes, they need to inject insulin so that they can keep their blood sugar control normal. Uh, but insulin does a lot of different things in our body. So first of all, it removes all this glucose from the bloodstream and puts it into cells for energy production or for storage. But its main role is a fat storage hormone because it makes you store fat. That's the very important thing to remember here. We don't want insulin or we don't want too much insulin because that would make us store more fat. Um, so, uh, sorry, just go back here. Um, the highest spike of glucose we have from carbohydrate or from sugar foods that we have, the higher insulin production happens. So it's, uh, I'll show you a diagram now, you will see very, very clearly that it's a direct link. The more glucose you have or the higher the spike, the higher the spike of insulin is followed afterwards. Mm -hmm. And the roller coaster continues because then whenever we have this high spike, we usually get a crash. And then the higher the spike, the deeper the crash. And when we have the crash, this is when we have the cravings again. This is when we feel that we need a snack again. And we feel tired or low mood or irritated or even dizzy. And that's how the roller coaster just carries on. Right, so this is the comparison uh, because uh, again, I, I try to, um, even nutrition, it's not a science uh, per se, it's not like a mathematical science, but I like to look at, uh, at all of the processes that happen in, like in the mathematical view almost, because that's easy then to see and for me to analyze what's happening. So this is the comparison of what happens when you have your meals, yeah, so this is when you have your breakfast, your lunch, your dinner, and obviously because you have carbohydrates in your meals, you produce insulin, and that's a calculation of how much fat you gain after those meals. And then obviously when you have breaks between your meals, this is when your blood sugar goes down, and your body needs to top it up from the cells. So the reverse happens. And when this reverse happens, when your cells actually open up and release sugar into your bloodstream, because you have low blood sugar, you've used all of it almost, this is when you actually can tap into your fat stores and use them for energy. So you can see when there is um, this, this little dip here, a negative dip, this is when a little bit of fat can be burned for energy. And the same happens after lunch, but then look what happens during eight hour sleep. This is when you, when you fast normally. So the, a lot of fat loss actually happens during our sleep. And um, we will look at this again in terms of when we look at different um, regimes, when you have you know, snacks in between what happens when you have in intermittent fasting, what happens, or when you manipulate the amount of carbohydrates, what happens. Mm. Of course, what we want to remember from this is that we want more of this. This is when the fat burning happens. Yeah. So we don't want to have a lot of time when we store fat. Mm. Um, the blood sugar swing or this roller coaster also has a lot of uh, other effects on how we feel. It's not just about our weight. We also, when we have this up and down in our blood sugar, we feel tiredness, we feel anxious, irritable. We, have, we feel hungry more often um, uh, after especially very quickly absorbed sugars. We, feel, we can feel sleepy even all the time. Uh, we can have fatigue and forgetfulness and inability to concentrate and even some, sometimes headaches. Uh, but most importantly for our session today is obviously the fat storage. So this is a, a demonstration of how different food groups affect our blood glucose. Because we know if we eat sugar, we get sugar in our blood. But what happens if we eat fat and protein? Because the only three groups of macronutrients that we have is fat, protein, and carbohydrates. 
So here you can actually see that if we just have fat, this is the amount of fat storage that occurs or can occur in response to fat. Now, this is the comparison to protein. So yes, protein can sometimes raise blood sugar just a little bit, um, and which will be followed by insulin production. And when you have insulin production, the fat burning obviously stops. But look at the carbohydrate. Yeah, so this is digestible carbohydrate because we also have carbohydrate that is not digestible, such as undigestible fiber, for example. So the response between when we compare fat, protein, and carbohydrate is quite different. So this is one way how you can manipulate the amount of insulin that you produce during the day is by restricting that carbohydrate. This is why the low carbohydrate diets work, ketogenic diets work, paleo works, and Atkin, Atkins diets work because they all restrict carbohydrates total carbohydrates that you eat during the day. Um, now, this is just the, again, just the uh, illustration of what different foods, what kind of effects it can have on you. So if you have coffee and cake, we know obviously it's too much sugar, it's very easily digestible and uh, absorbable sugar. So it goes straight into your bloodstream, you get a spike and then you get a drop. And if you compare, that's, this is called glycemic response. So what your uh, glucose and your insulin is doing after eating certain food. But if you compare it to peppers and hummus, for example, so this is the green line, you don't get the spike. Even though if you calculate the amount of carbohydrates and it could be exactly the same number, you can have a lot of hummus and you can have a small piece of cake there's still going to be a very different response in our blood sugar and insulin consequently. So insulin and energy. Um, who believes that breakfast is the most important meal of the day and you should be eating every two to three hours so you can increase your metabolism? And also I, I see a lot of uh, nutritionists, obviously a lot of uh, uh, official advice in terms of weight loss is that we have to have regular meals uh, in order to regulate our blood sugar. Is this all true? Let's look. So what happens when your blood sugar goes down? You've eaten at 8 a.m. in the morning and let's say by about 11 p.m. you've used all that sugar that all that carbohydrate, all that energy that you could make from, from those carbohydrates. And now it's slowly going down. Okay. Do we have to eat something in order to keep it up? Or do we feel like we need a stimulant at that point? Or do we need to eat again? But what happens if we don't eat and we don't take a snack or we don't take a stimulant like coffee? Do we, do we feel like we go into um, run out of energy and die? No, that doesn't happen, obviously. We know that we can carry on. But some people do feel, because they they on this blood sugar roller coaster, they feel very um, not addicted, but almost dependent on this next snack or next you know coffee so to keep them going. Otherwise, they feel like they're going to have a crash. But our body is very clever. It has inbuilt mechanisms in order to keep us going naturally without the need for another snack or another food. So this is a slightly complicated um, um, picture here, but what it explains really, so where do we start? Right, we start here on the left when we have uh, our food here. So we've eaten, we've increased blood glucose. We tell uh, pancreas to produce insulin. We produce insulin here. Insulin puts some glucose here in our liver for storage and also converts uh, some of the carbohydrates into fat. These are the fat molecules here or fat cells. Um, then what happens? We start, the time passes by, our blood glucose begins to come back to normal levels. Yes. Then we 
uh, it starts going down. Let's say this is when we go to sleep. And then because of that the, there is another signal that is then generated in response to lowered blood sugar that tells our pancreas to produce an opposite hormone to insulin. This is called glucagon, here it is. So glucagon does completely the opposite. It tells your cells to release all the sugar in the blood. And then if the cells don't have any sugar, it will make them to convert, take all the fat stored in them and convert them for energy in order to then make glucose and release that glucose into your bloodstream because your body will always keep your glucose in the blood at the same level it needs to, it has to happen. And then what happens as a result, your blood glucose goes to normal levels. And that's why during the night we fast and we don't even feel it. Now, um, it takes about um, uh, it takes about ten to twelve hours. We also have uh, a, an alternative source of energy that is stored stored in our liver. It's called glycogen store. It's about hundred grams. Depends on the person. If you exercise a lot, if you have a lot of storage in the liver, you're probably going to have more. So it takes about ten to twelve hours for us to deplete our liver glycogen. And then we, um, afterwards, we then tap into our fat stores. But this glycogen usage first and then taking your fat stores for energy production, it does have um, a lot of different, uh, it, it happens at the different periods of time for different people. Again, depends on your metabolism, depends on where you are, your age, your, your fat amount and everything else. Um, but if insulin is present in your blood, that fat burning always stops. Yeah. So again, the picture here shows um, uh, what, uh, what happens when we have insulin in blood. So here it is, insulin in blood. We have uh, storage in liver cells. We have storage, again, of the fat and all, all of the uh, sugar in muscle cells. And then we make adipose cells, so that's fat cells. Um, right. Uh, we then have um, something that's called metabolic flexibility. So this is the ability for us to switch between glucose burning for energy and fat burning for energy. Um, our body prefers to use glucose just because it's, it's easy for our body. It doesn't need to put in any effort, really. It's very easy to burn glucose and get energy or calories from that so that we can run on it. But when we need to do the reverse, when we don't have available glucose in our blood, when our blood sugar goes down, when we have to go into reverse and try to get our fat stores and burn them for energy, if a person isn't used to that, and hasn't used that metabolic pathway a lot, we call these people metabolically unflexible. So they, it's difficult for them to make that switch. They struggle, they may struggle, they may get headachey, they may get dizziness. Some people refer to it as hypoglycemia. They have very low blood sugar and they feel almost shaky. Uh, and it does happen, uh, so I've seen this happening in a lot of clients, obviously, they're too dependent on that glucose, next glucose, next glucose, to keep them going. So um, metabolic flexibility develops and you can develop it. It's the ability to switch very easily between the two main sources. You can either use glucose and then if you've used all the glucose and you have nothing else, then you can go very easily into your fat stores without noticing any symptoms whatsoever. So this is called metabolic flexibility. And every single person can develop that. And this is the, um, the central, most important thing, I would say, that if you master it, you, you, you're gonna have absolutely no issues with regulating your, your body weight, your body fat percentage at all. So when we eat every two to three hours, so this is what the mainstream media tells us that we need to, in order to keep our blood sugar stable, we need to eat every two to three hours to keep our insulin, uh, to keep our blood sugar constantly stable. 
we what we're doing really was we we constantly producing insulin as a response to those you know very uh, very off uh, very frequent meals and that reverse really the glucagon pathway never gets used during the day and what it also does it makes us too sensitive to low blue low uh blood glucose this when the blood sugar goes down and because we become very um, very sensitive to hunger and we become tired and shaky and we have this, we, we almost develop that dependency on sugar and stimulants. Um, but if you develop this metabolic flexibility and you can easily switch between the fats so between the, uh, the energy sources, you lose all of this. You, you don't need to have another snack. You don't even feel that you need another snack. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is just a list of, um, I'll say, uh, not consequences, but if you feel like any of this apply to you, then it suggests that maybe you, you have this metabolically inflexible status, so to say. So if you get sleepy after eating carbohydrates, that's, uh, that's one of the signs that uh, your metabolism is not flexible enough. You can't go five hours uh, without eating between the meals. You get a midday crash every day after lunch. You know, like you, you kind of falling asleep after lunch. Uh, you feel like you must snack to sustain your energy levels. And fasting is very difficult for you. And if you manage to power through the discomfort, you actually get worse results when you, than you were expecting. Like a lot of people go on the fasting diets and they, instead of losing fat, they lose muscle or you know, there's absolutely no difference with their fat loss. And you also feel like you can't function without a steady stream of stimulants like coffee, tea or sugar. Uh, it's like, why would an obese person who has a lot of fat stores would ever go hungry or feel hungry? Uh, is that that they don't have enough fat stores? No, of course they do. They just can't get to them. They don't have the ability to use that. It's too painful for them because the average overweight person uh, is used to being in the fed state rather than in the fasted state. And it continue, they continue to burn in glucose rather than fat at the cellular level. So we have mitochondria in every cell and mitochondria can make energy from fat or from carbohydrates, sugar. And if you're constantly feeding it sugar, it will preferentially just use one pathway to make um, energy from glucose rather than from fat. And will, it will almost forget how to do, you know, how to make energy from fat. Uh, so it's really important. We'll also look at the mitochondrial function um, later. And um, we, when we produce a very high level of insulin, um, we, we may get something that's called insulin resistance. And this is the beginning of our metabolism really slowing down because you produce insulin and your cells go, mm, you always produce an, uh, so much insulin, we're not gonna react to that. So yeah, let that blood sugar be high. And your cells become less sensitive because you constantly pump in a lot of insulin. So your cells become almost like, we don't wanna hear about it. We don't wanna hear that signal anymore. And that's called insulin resistance. So chronically high insulin levels, uh, they promote fat storage. And uh, uh, as I mentioned before, they also change, um, make some changes in mitochondria, how it functions. And uh, as the people run out of glucose from their last meal, instead of seamlessly transition into burning fat, they become hungry and they want more glucose from carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. So, but how do we stop this? How do we stop this dependency on glucose? We do have another way, as I mentioned before, to make energy, and it is from our fat stores. Um, so there are several ways to do it. We can either, how we can manipulate this insulin production, we can either drop the total amount of carbohydrates in our diets. It doesn't really matter what kind of diet you choose, or well, I don't want to call it diet because I want to call it a permanent change in how you eat, your way of eating. Uh, you can either control the amount of carbohydrates that you consume. In that way, you would produce less insulin during the day. 
exercise does help. This is why, of course, exercise is important because it improves insulin sensitivity of our cells to the glucose. And we can also do it with intermittent fasting. So it's, um, it's a very fine tuned um, process, I would say, and it will be different for every person. In my experience, Again, if I give a certain, say, low carbohydrate diet to three different people, they will have three different results. Someone will be probably will be too much and it will be a lot of weight loss straight away, which is also not great because we want it to be slow and steady. Uh, another person will have absolutely no difference because it's not enough for them. And the third person will be just right. So you will have to find your own kind of level where you are. And with intermittent fasting, what you do in with intermittent fasting is very similar. You exposing your body or you making your body during the fasted state to go into reverse and to burn the fat. So the longer the fasting period you making your body do, the more fat you can burn and the better it becomes every time because you're trying to develop that metabolic flexibility. You can also do it with caloric restriction. Uh, I'm not a fan of counting calories at all, as you pro could probably tell from the title of this um, uh, session, is because um, I don't think it's sustainable. Uh, there are studies to show that, uh, yes, low calorie diets uh, do work and they do help us lose weight it's just because eating fewer calories also equals less glucose available and less amount of carbohydrates going into you uh, but i just don't think because again all of the studies show that as as soon as people stop doing a calorie control diet you know they they regain all the weight and perhaps even more and uh, I've never met anyone any clients even who could do a calorie control diet for a long period of time. It's just not sustainable. Um, we will have to find more sustainable ways, more realistic diets that you can do for a longer period of time and something that is also healthy, of course. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, when your body fully adjusts to making that switch between burning carbs to burning fat, we um, people experience something that we call um, fasting high. When you start burning fat for energy, you produce something that's called ketones, right? And those ketones um, also, um, our brain uh, can use ketones as energy source. And uh, what the research actually showing that if our brain runs on glucose, uh, compared to ketones, we are much more efficient when we run on ketones. And I don't know if anyone, anyone heard of this fasting high. This is when you have elevated mood, you have increased energy levels, and you also get very good brain function just because you are running on those ketones. So when you burn the fat. So the periods of fasting between the meals, um, some research actually shows that it can be even more important for our, you know, to, to improve our metabolism than the composition of the diet, like low carbohydrate, for example. So it's not about the macronutrient breakdown. It's not about how much glucose or carbohydrates you have, although that's, that, that can work for some people. And that's why all of the diets like keto, low carb and Atkins do work. But what the research is now showing that is it's actually much easier to push your body into that um, uh, into that metabolic flexibility by just changing the timing of the meals and manipulating the fasting periods. Mm -hmm. So um, yes, the, uh, the, there is a device on the market, there are several of them actually, uh, that uh, analyze your breath and they can detect when you are in the fat burning mode. So like, for example, when we have those ketones and when we burn fat for energy as a main source, we will exhale something that's called acetone in our breasts as a byproduct of that fat burning. So the devices like this, they can pick up acetone in your breast 
they analyze it. So you just breathe out into it, it analyzes your breath and they can actually tell if you burn in fat or if you're still burning glucose. So this would help um, to personalize the amount of carbohydrates or the, the um, uh, fasting periods for you specifically. Because again, um, as I said before, it's so individual that sometimes it's impossible to predict when a person would dip into ketosis or um, you, you know, use fat for energy instead of glucose. Mm -hmm. Right, I think now is a good time, Stella, to stop and answer some questions. Uh, yeah. Sorry, yes, I'm just, so I'm just unmuting myself. Yeah, let's go through some of these questions that have come in. Um, so Shelley, Shelley asks, um, is there a better time of day to fast? Yes, and we are going to talk about it in the next section, yes. <clears throat> okay, okay, so we'll, we'll come to that. Um, there's some comments about intermittent fasting make you feel great. I've got to second that. Um, I, I have done intermittent fasting for years, and whenever I do it, it makes me feel alive, really amazing, <laughs> and um, clear-minded, like waking up in the morning and feeling um, really like... A, not groggy at all, very, uh, very aware and uh, energetic. Um, the, um, Nadia says um, she's skipping breakfast. She finds it the easiest meal to skip. Is it as effective as skipping lunch or dinner? Skipping when find it easy not to skip. Um, no, as long as you, you manage to keep your fasting window, it doesn't really matter uh, where and or what time you have that fasting window. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so I, I have a question about that actually, because, um, you know, I, I think breakfast, skipping breakfast is, uh, it works for a lot of people. Um, and then you, you know, you kind of move to lunch, but um, I think a lot of people s struggle when they get into that mid afternoon, that four, five o'clock, when um, even, it, I mean, I know for myself as well, but I know it's quite um, common. Where you, where you hit four or five o'clock and your blood sugar drops and that's when you want to reach for, for uh, the glucose, so to speak. Yeah, if you are within your eating window, you'll say if you're doing 16, eight and you're within that eight hour eating window, it's, uh, the research actually shows that it doesn't matter. You, you can eat, uh, you can eat two times, you can eat three times, four times. Uh, it, it doesn't really have as long as you keep the 16 hour fast it still works mm -hmm. yeah okay so if you do 16 8 um which we'll talk about uh next uh when, once you get into the eight you can eat as frequently as you want is what you're saying um yes i mean obviously we still have to keep in mind that those graphs where we show in how much insulin we produce in response to each meal uh, so the, the total amount of insulin will still be slightly higher, but it may not be su such a big difference for you personally. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, how long should a fast last between meals? We've said that 16, eight, but generally, if you're having even three meals a day, how long should you, you know, if you're not doing the intermittent fasting and you're just having three meals a day, how long should you take before you have your next meal? Uh, I would say probably about five hours. I'm actually just, uh, the next section is about different types of intermittent fasting. Okay, perfect. Okay, we've got All the questions are about that, is not they? Yeah, it's about the ketosis, okay. yeah. Okay, and, this is uh, not not recommended for, yeah. Okay, yeah. so okay, we can let, let me move on. <laughs> Let's just move on. Sorry? Should we just move on? And then we can come back to the questions to see if there's anything that wasn't covered then. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so frequency of eating, that's the questions that everyone's asking. Does it matter? Right. Um, I'm still kind of going back to those three statements that I said that um, are very much pushed by the media and mainstream um, kind of uh, dietary advice that you should be eating um, frequent small meals throughout the day in order to sustain your blood sugar. So just wanted to kind of show this to you that benefits of five, six meals per day, let's look at them. So you get to eat more often, which is obviously a benefit. We all like to eat. 
Um, you never let yourself get super hungry. So you never reach the point when you are very, very hungry and angry so that you make unhealthy food choices so you have better control. And that's a perceived uh, benefit. And then eating every few hours also can boost your metabolism. That's the belief. And your blood sugar levels stay balanced, right? Keep that thought. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the uh, disadvantages of that are the, your body actually gets used to constant supply of energy. So it's less likely to burn fat for energy because you're constantly giving it something to eat. It always has energy on the go. And constant stimulation of digestion, don't forget you're always digesting, digesting, digesting. Your digestive capacity will get tired eventually. You also lose sight of your body's hunger cues, right? Because your body will actually tell you when it's hungry. And uh, it's a very subtle um, kind of signal that you do need to fine tune to hear properly. If you're just feeding your body without feeling the hunger, uh, your body's not gonna even bother talking to you about it. So insulin effect also, keep that in mind. It's released to deliver sugar from your bloodstream to your cells or to your liver and muscle for storage or for um, energy production. And whatever sugar is left is then going to be stored as fat. So if you're constantly keeping your insulin up during the day by eating five, six meals a day, that's what you're doing. You're just storing and storing and storing. And you also think about food all the time. I, I know it, I've been there, constant snacking, because that's what, when I studied at university, that's what the general belief was that we have to eat in order to keep our blood sugar stable, even though we all had really good snacks still. So this is the comparison of eating five meals per day and eating three meals per day. This is the amount of insulin you produce. It's very easy to see what's happening. So in the second uh, uh, graph here at the bottom, you don't even, during the day, you don't even dip into fat burning at all. You just don't even get there. As soon as your blood sugar goes down, you have a snack and it goes up again. You see, it's like always on the up. So you're constantly storing. As opposed to when you have just three meals a day without snacks, you can see that between each meal, you do dip into fat burning which is great. So that's an advantage, I would say. Now, what is the optimal frequency, really? Uh, unfortunately, the, the, the answer is this. It's very individual. And uh, it could be that a person with adrenal issues, a very stressed person, would still need to have uh, frequent meals and in their eating window rather than having big breaks between each meal, just because if they... Um, if they're too stressed, they produce too much cortisol already and not eating makes them even more stressed. So they will produce more cortisol, but that's a very specific case. So people with adrenal issues can't really do intermittent fasting. We don't really recommend that. But then the normal one, and this is the, uh, what I normally recommend to start with would be three times per day with five hour breaks between each meal. This is actually quite normal eating. You eat at eight and then you eat at one and then you eat at say six or seven. So as long as you keep five hour fast between each meal, it does work because you dip in into fat burning. After about three and a half, four hours, you will dip there. And it does work for weight regulation. There is this whole, it's called metabolic balance diet that is built on, on this, um, of the frequency of meals in, in, in this way. Uh, they also change the macronutrient um, ratios. So they do reduce the amount of carbohydrates, they increase the amount of fat and increase the amount of protein, uh, coupled with three times per day with five hour breaks, works a treat. Very simple, very easy to follow and perhaps one of the most effective that I've seen. Um, another way to do it would be to have two or three meals, uh, but restrict your eating window to eight hours. That's another very popular way. A lot of people doing it and a lot of research now shows that it is, um, it's very effective. Plus it doesn't have many um, adverse effects or, you know, almost everyone can do it. Um, but again, it's very individual. Some people can't. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, there is also 5-2 diet you probably heard of. So this is when you eat normally for five days and you fast on two non-consecutive days. Well, by fasting, you've probably seen the, the 5-2 diet by Michael Mosley. So he uh, suggested to have 500 calories for women and 600 calories for men, so under six or 500 calories. By restricting the, um, the calories on those days, it, your body goes into a fasting mode or a fasting mimicking mode, and it also produces very similar results. Although with 5-2, um, I don't, see, the compliance and um, is not that great because um, I think what my clients tell me, they say, oh, as soon as I start eating, then I can't stop eating for the day. So it's really difficult for them to limit it to 500 calories. They prefer not to eat at all, and then they feel better. They don't feel the, you know, raving hunger or um, cravings. So with 5-2, it's a little bit, you know, also very individual. There is also alternate day fasting that's been used in the studies and uh, that's considered very effective. But again, I don't think that's very uh, sustainable, I would say. Um, right, now if we compare, again, going back to insulin, how does it work? When you understand this about insulin, it doesn't really matter what diet you go for, you, you will know what you need to do. You can almost make your own diet up. <laughs> Uh, as long as you kind of keep in mind how much insulin you produce during the day and you keep a, a limit on that and you know how to manipulate it, you will lose weight or you will lose fat or you'll get that fat storage burned for energy eventually. So we are comparing here three main meals per day uh, spread out throughout the day uh, with two meals in eight hour period. And this is what we're seeing. Uh, we're looking at the fat burning at the bottom of the screen, so the green line. So we, when we take the fat burning um, area, right, mathematically we're calculating. So obviously we can see when we're eating twice a day in eight hour window, we burn a lot more fat compared to just three meals a day. But again, for some people, it could be too much. For some people, it may be not enough. So you will have to find your own kind of, it's a spectrum, right? And there's, there are extremes. So you'll have to find your own point on that spectrum. And of course, you know, 16A diet's been uh, popularized with lots of celebrities like Nicole Kidman reportedly has um, uh, 16A, but also uh, she controls her carbohydrate intake. Um, Hugh Jackman talked about it uh, a lot as well. Um, so time restricted eating is really not a new thing and it's nothing uh, that I would say is uh, um, radical even at all because throughout human history we have Ramadan, we have Great Land, these are the examples of intermittent fasting regimes and um, what is also important here how we now understand how it works and why it's so good for us is because it also improves how our mitochondria functions and these are little powerhouses or power plants within our cells these are the ones that actually make energy they burn that sugar molecule and they create energy from it or they burn that fat molecule and create energy from it and depending on what type of mitochondria you have what they do exactly, you can improve your metabolism as well. So it almost like it flips the switch from glucose burning to fat burning for energy, yes, the intermittent fasting thing. And it develops or it, it gives you this fat adaptation that we all want. It removes dependency on snacks and glucose and it gives you that metabolic flexibility that we talked about. Perhaps it's even easier than just restricting carbohydrates. So you don't really need to restrict carbohydrates that much if you're doing the intermittent fasting. Mm -hmm. But again, up to you to choose. Some people prefer intermittent fasting. Some people prefer just to drop carbohydrates and both can work in the same way. Um, yes, um, so mitochondria, our power reactors. The more mitochondria we have in our cells, the more energy we can produce, the better our metabolism is. So we need to look after our mitochondria. There's a lot of different things that we can do, like exercise, it can improve the number of mitochondria. Cold exposure is very effective. This is why, you know, it's, it's uh, 
advised, I suppose, to have a cardio session in the morning on an empty stomach and then have a cold shower. The combination of this would increase the amount of mitochondria in your cells. Um, so these are just the simple, easy things to do. And of course, the intermittent fasting also would improve your mitochondria quality, but also increase the number of mitochondria. Mm -hmm. There's just a couple of studies that I, I found that, uh, like, for example, high intensity intermittent exercise uh, improves our mitochondrial mass. So it makes them more efficient or makes them bigger and also makes them more efficient at producing energy. Um, Okay, so some benefits of intermittent fasting beyond weight loss. Uh, I was talking a little bit about this um, keto high when people feel this incredible brain power and uh, energy when they go into ketosis, yeah? This is when we burn fat instead of carbohydrates. So um, it can increase rates of neurogenesis in the brain. So we actually recently discovered that we can create new brain cells in the brain and we can do it with intermittent fasting. It improves our brain performance. It has shown really great, significant improvement in our mood and our focus and our memory. Um, it also stimulates, as I said, uh, production of new brain cells, but it also stimulates the connection, those, um, uh, you know, the, the communication between our brain cells. So the, the synapses is also improved. Uh, it's, um, yeah, it's just for, for that particular reason. So BD and F protein uh, is referred to, um, uh, it has been um, found to improve neuroplasticity, that connection between the brains. There's a lot of research on that thing as well. Mm -hmm. And it also improves or increases our human growth hormone. And that also improves our muscle mass. And muscle mass is also something that is, um, can affect our metabolic rate. Mm -hmm. Because the more muscles we have, uh, the better we, or the more calories we actually burn in the rested state. And uh, that's why obviously training or physical activity or building muscle mass is considered one, one of the best things to do for weight regulation. So it's not really cardio exercise when you run for hours that doesn't build your muscle it just trains your cardiovascular system which is also you know also has its benefits but the the most eff uh, effective thing you can do to improve your metabolism is to actually build your muscles so that the muscle percentage increases it compared to your fat percentage and your um, other tissues because muscles can just consume a lot of energy and that's why your metabolic rate goes up mm -hmm. Right, so this is about the ideal timing. Someone asked that question. When do you do this intermittent fasting? Um, it's up to you, but uh, what this green layer here um, has shown in studies to be uh, most what people choose and what works, what people can stick to. It's also not, um, uh, when we choose a diet, an ideal diet for us, it's about how uh, sustainable, how realistic it is for us, first of all, rather than what is the best diet actually? You have to find your, your own best diet. So people do stick to this most, they find it easier to stick to. So when they start eating at 12 o'clock at noon and then they finish eating by 8 p.m. seems to work for most people. But some people like Nicole Kidman there in the report, she, she eats from 10 a.m. till 6 p.m. Me personally, I would struggle with that because I need to eat after 6 p.m. I wouldn't know what else to do with myself. <laughs> Right, and as one of the questions were there on the chat, yes, it's not for everyone. And it does have a lot of contraindications. So for example, anyone with the history of eating disorders can't have intermittent fasting because it can trigger the eating disorder again. So that's contraindication. Anyone with adrenal dysfunction, chronic stress, um, you know, dysregulated cortisol, which you can actually test for and you can see if you fall into that category. Again, not recommended at all because it's gonna make things worse. Um, pregnancy, breastfeeding, obviously elderly people can't have their children. Patients on certain medications, especially diabetics, um, because when you take diabetic uh, medication, it changes insulin, glucose ratios. So 
it can, it can actually be very dangerous for you if you go if you have very low blood sugar and you fast and you're diabetic, you, you can die, obviously. So that's that's not recommended. But if you look at the Public Health UK official advice in terms of intermittent fasting, despite all of the evidence that there is about the benefits and about the you know, improvement in brain function even and weight regulation, um, they still say the benefits are unproven and uh, still recommends to consult your doctor or GP before you attempt any intermittent fasting. Mm -hmm. And if you do it, you have to do it with professional supervision, of course. Mm -hmm. Right, there are some practical tips that I want you to, to um, kind of remember from today's session. Um, I think, no, no, it's in the wrong place. Um, we'll come back to that. And I also wanted to talk about a little bit about low carbohydrate diets and how they work. This is alternative way to intermittent fasting. Yeah, so you can also control your insulin and you know, go into that fat burning mode easily. So the general recommendation um, of what is low carbohydrate, it's under 20% of your total calories per day that come from um, carbohydrate. So if we calculate it on the base of 2000 calories as being your normal calorie intake, that means 400 grams can come from carbohydrates. So we know that a one gram of carbohydrate provides you four calories. So that would work then as 100 gram of carbohydrates per day. So you need to keep it under for under 100 grams of carbohydrate per day in order to get into a low carbohydrate diet. When you go uh, more extreme, so that's something like ketogenic type of diet, this is when say 90% of your daily um, calories come from fat. Uh, so we have to then restrict your carbohydrates to under 10%, which works out to under 50 grams or less per day. And that's, that's hard for many people because one apple gives you 25 grams already. So fruit, sugars, grains, legumes, root vegetables even, they all contain carbohydrates. And if you restrict it so much, you have to ask the question about sustainability and actually is it a healthy diet for you to carry on long-term? So you have to find a golden middle somewhere there. Mm -hmm. So what I normally recommend to start with and try to then manipulate further depending on your results, we'll start with working with the ratios. And we also, I don't really like when we talk about restrictions or we say, oh, you have to cut this out because that's when people feel, oh no, I, I don't know if I can do this. And then that's kind of a negative thing rather than positive. So I'd like to start with the positive, something like, okay, here are your targets. This is what you need to eat per day rather. So we focus on something that you need to eat and achieve rather than something that you have to cut out. And that normally does work better. Mm -hmm. So this is how you can calculate your basal metabolic rate. And it's, this is the formulas for men and for women, but you don't really need to remember this or write this down. Um, there's a lot of different um, uh, online calculators. If you just Google BMR calculator, there'll be plenty because it needs to take into account your your age, your activity levels, size of your body, obviously what you weigh now in order to work out how many calories you need per day in order to just be and live, right? And it will be different than for each person depending on their size and their activity level and their age. And that will help you work out the amount of carbohydrates depending on the percentage of the daily calories. So like, for example, I did here the calculation for 2000 calories, but for someone who says 50 kilograms, that probably going to be 1300 calories per day. And consequently, the, when you do a low carb diet, that number is going to be much lower. So you will have to calculate that. Mm -hmm. um, right. So the, the best place to start, I would say, is the ratios on the plate. So it kind of um, gives you a little shortcut in terms of, oh, do I need to calculate all this BMR and these calories? It's totally not my thing. And uh, you may get confused by, you know, calculating all of this. 
So just split your plate, uh, like you see in here. Half of your plate needs to be covered by vegetables. You can see there's leafy greens and salad here. There's some other vegetables here. Um, now, quarter of your plate um, are your carbohydrates. So you're limiting your carbohydrates in this way by just ratios. So when we say carbohydrate, car carbohydrates, that's, that's your grains, that's your root vegetables, your legumes, and also fruit go there. Mm -hmm. And then quarter would be your protein. And if you follow that, this plate ratio, it will automatically restrict carbohydrates because by the time you eat all these vegetables and all of this protein, you're gonna be so full that there will be just no space for any additional you know, carbohydrates. Um, right, so like some examples here, like how I normally ask my clients or what I normally say to my clients to focus on, what to focus on. Uh, we talk about priorities. So we need to think about nutrient dense foods rather than calories or anything else, right? So I want them to focus on fiber, protein and healthy fat. So these are just the examples. So eggs with two vegetables for breakfast. Eggs provide you your protein, your healthy fat. Vegetables give you the fiber. Large vegetable salad with protein. Again, fiber, protein, and of course you use the dressing, olive oil, that's your healthy fat. Dinner, fish and two vegetables. Again, fish could be, if it's oily fish, your, your fat, your protein, vegetables give you fiber. Um, yogurt, again, protein. So, um, you see there's, there's not much space there for carbohydrates at all. Like if you really, really wanted, you probably could feed a cake somewhere there, but I mean, it's, it's plenty of food. Um, right, so second option here, again, just slightly different um, food um, uh, suggestions uh, that you can have for breakfast, like smoked salmon, avocado, and rye toast. So this, this is your carbohydrate here, actually, rye toast. But rye toast gives you not just carbs, it also gives you fiber. And I think there's some seeds in that bread as well. So that gives you healthy fat as well. Uh, we're not only restricting the carbohydrates here, but we also um, reducing the spike of that glucose. We're trying to keep it almost unnoticeable. Even if you get some kind of increase in blood sugar, so it's not crazy going up and then down. It's only having a slight increase and then a slight reduction. So fiber helps with that, protein helps with that. So this is why it's really um, not good to have a carbohydrate on its own on an empty stomach because that's just going to go straight into your bloodstream and cause the spike. This is when you uh, when it's really important to combine each meal with a protein and with healthy fat and with fiber, it will slow down the release of carbohydrate into your bloodstream. And this is just the vegan option, I think, yeah, of the fiber, protein and healthy fat. But again, the central message here, we always have to think about nutrient density, right? Because the healthy metabolism and weight there's so many things that can prevent you from, uh, from working properly. Um, we're going to talk next time about a lot of different things, um, uh, such as, you know, we we're going to talk about the calories in, calories out. Is that actually working as it's supposed to be working or we think it's working? We're going to talk about resistant weight loss as well, why this is happening, because yeah, it's all good to know all of this information. But again, I do see in, in, in clinical practice, I do see people who trying so hard to lose weight and nothing works. It does happen and there are reasons for that. We'll look at the hormones. Your thyroid can do this. So if you don't produce enough thyroid hormones, it slows down your metabolism. Also, we'll look at your adrenals. Again, if you produce too much cortisol, you will have resistant weight loss. Mm -hmm. We'll look at genetics because of course, we are very, very different genetically. And whatever's good for me doesn't mean it's going to work in the same way for you because we are totally different. There is also very exciting research about our gut microbiome. Um, we actually think it's the missing link that, you know, the, we, we can't explain sometimes why this person has exactly the same diet as I am, but I'm losing weight and this person doesn't. But 
there's nothing wrong with the person. The thyroid works well, adrenals work well, and we check all of the obvious reasons and nothing's nothing's wrong. So we now think that it's due to the gut microbiome. Um, it's very interesting research. Basically, there are several types of bacteria that make more fat and more sugar um, and in our guts, and then we would absorb that. So basically, whatever we eat, double that, and then we will absorb all of that. So when we manipulate gut microbiome, we can make ourselves lose weight just by changing different types of bacteria in our gut. We'll also look at different uh, vitamins and minerals because we know there's a lot of research about vitamin D and weight loss. Very interesting research, so I wanna show you all of this. And of course, this, all of this can be tested and all of this can be looked at if, if you struggle with, with weight loss, obviously everything needs to be looked at. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there are several uh, slides here I kind of missed, but um, we can talk about them next time. But is there anything else that you wanted me to add? Me, if if you want to send some particular questions or particular, yeah, uh, we can. You, you know what? You, um, we can put put your comments on the forum if there's anything in addition to Olga's extensive list there. <laughs> I don't know. I'll give you a prize if you can think of anything in addition to that list. <laughs> but, um, but, but yeah, just put it in the comments in the forum. Um, I do have just a couple of questions here. Um, what drinks can you have during intermittent fasting? So obviously nothing with sugar because, uh, you know, that's very high carb. Um, how, how does alcohol fit into that? And what alcohols, I mean, I know certain spirits have less sugar and less carb. Yeah, well, ideally you would need to include them in your eating window, but if you can't, I mean, there's zero sugar Prosecco, I think, or champagne and some yeah. spirits, yes, they are better than say mixers, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and um, is there a test to establish if one has dysregulated cortisol? which I guess we're going to talk about next time with adrenal issues. Um, so we can address that in ne next week and there are tests. And I know you, you actually um, do a lot of these tests yourself, don't you? Um, you do a lot of testing with your clients. So um, on that note, if anyone, uh, we, we work with Olga and Cornelius uh, in Body Maya. So if, if anyone is interested in creating like a personalized um, package, just drop drop us an email, info at Wellbeing Escapes, and um, we'll put you in touch with them. Um, okay, uh, will you cover the role of leptin next week? Now that's an interesting one. Yes, I'll write it down, yes. Write that down, that's a big one, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, and there's, uh, I have a two centimeter goldstone Will intermittent fasting help with managing that? Oh, I'd need to check that. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if it's if it's contra. It may be contraindicated because if you fast and you have the goldstone and it'll try to come out, it may yeah, it may, it may make things work. Oh, sorry, worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I'll check that. Yes, um, goldstone. Yeah. So much content, thank you so much, Olga. There's there's a there's a lot to take in, but it's um, um any tips for menopausal women? We could, we'll cover that next week around hormones. Um, and uh, yes, uh, Wendy, just drop 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 me a line, and I'll put you in touch with um, with uh, Olga and and Cornelius. So um. Just a, a final word for me, because I have been a friend of intermittent fasting for years and I come on and off it, on and off it. Um, I have one question, selfishly, before we go, um, which is, is it, like, does it become a way of life? Is it something that you should continue with if you do the, you know, the um, eight, uh, 16? Is that something that you should continue with all the time or could you go back to three meals a day and then flip backwards and forwards. Cause I, I kind of flip from eight, um, 16, eight, five, two, three meals a day. What's your view on that before we just close it? I, I think you need to be consistent, yes. Okay. 
that answers my question. <laughs> okay, that's wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Olga. So much information packed in there. Um, we will. I, I, can I ask you for something? Can you share with me that Bant image? Oh, yes. I'm going to put that on the forum, the one that gives you the guide on um, how you know what you have on your plate. That's good. Um, and maybe a couple of the diet pages, and then we'll put those up there so people can refer to them um, for this week. Any questions, any comments, please post in the forum. Obviously, I'm trying to push you to use the forum just in case you haven't realized if <laughs> it's not that obvious, but, um, but please do so. And um, really looking forward to finding out more next week. Olga, uh, thanks for your time. Everybody have a wonderful week ahead. Stay strong, stay mentally strong, stay happy. <laughs> all of those things, we'll, we'll all get through this. And um, giving everybody lots of um, good wishes and uh, looking forward to seeing you next week.